Good afternoon, guys. How you doing? This is a great 12 o'clock crowd. Thanks for coming out and, uh, and being here. We're going to get overflow to the service. This is awesome. Um, we're starting boot camp, and since boot camp really is basic training, I thought what we would do is, is talk about some basics and kind of get us to the place where we recognize how important it is as a believer in Jesus that we grow in Christ. we got to grow in Him. You know, our faith has to grow stronger. And our uh, walk with Him, our love relationship with Him has to grow stronger on a regular basis. And so that's kind of what we're going to look at here today. I want to look at three things. I want to look, first of all, at the purpose of our lives. I think, you know, we probably all got to the place in our life where we ask ourselves the question, what am I doing here, right? Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And why is God giving me breath? Why is He giving me this heartbeat? Why do I keep seeing these sunrises? You know, keep seeing these days coming by. And uh, I think it's important for us to know the purpose of our lives. The second thing we're going to look at is the fact that, you know, there there is a God. God does exist. He's real. He's as real as the nose on your face. And there's going to be times probably in your dealings with people, whether it's at work or wherever it is, that you're going to probably run into some people now and again that don't believe in God. You're going to probably run into some people that have a hard time with the whole God thing. And, and I would love for you to be able to go to them and say a few things that, you know, maybe in the middle of weapons they're not going to fall down on their knees and say, Yes, that is a goal! Maybe they're not going to do that. But uh, maybe after you're done talking to them, maybe they'll at least have something. It's kind of interesting how you can plant seeds in people's minds and those seeds can take root and they can grow and they can become stronger and stronger and ideas can become beliefs in people's lives and it could, you can be the one to, to start that in their life, to be a help to them in whatever reason. The last thing we're going to look at is something that's very foundational to all of us. We stand as a church on a thing called the gospel. And you guys have heard about that and you know about that, but... The truth of the matter is we have people from all different faiths and all different backgrounds that come to our church from all different denominations, but we not and not. So everybody else says, hey, that's cool. Let's check it out. And you're from another denomination, and you've got a whole other idea about what the gospel says, or about what it is, or what does it even mean. And it's important that we kind of have that rock-solid foundation about the gospel, that the gospel is rooted in a thing called grace. That it's not rooted in the fact that we have works and we do good stuff and we're trying to be good and blah, 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 blah. And it just has really nothing to do with the gospel. So we'll look at that. And I will tell you this. It goes against human reasoning. So nailing down the gospel and totally understanding the gospel is a difficult thing to do because it goes against the natural way you think. All right? So let's say you're an artist and you want to make something. You get to choose to make whatever you want to make. You get to choose the size of it. You get to choose the shape of it. You get to choose the color of it. You get to choose uh, the purpose of it. Because whoever makes something is the one that gets the right to choose the purpose of whatever they make. And whoever makes something is the one that owns it. If you choose to make something, it's your choice. It was your idea. And because you made it, you get to own it. Now, the cool thing about that is that's the same relationship that we have with God. Guess what? God chose to make you. He chose to make me. You were God's idea. And I really think that that would be a cool t-shirt. If you had a t-shirt that just says, I was God's idea. That would be nice, right? I mean, it's true, too. The bottom line is, the only reason you're here, the only reason you're on this planet, is because God had the idea to make you. God specifically decided to make you. And He's the one that gave you your size. And He's the one that gave you your shape. And He's the one that gave you your color. And He's the one that chose what your purpose would be in life. And guess what? Because He made you, He owns you. I'm just going to cut the chase. He owns you. You are here because of Him. And you are here for His glory and for His praise. And that's pretty much the bottom line. And He made you for a really good reason. Now, if you're God's idea, how many of you believe God's ever had a bad idea? I don't think so. God didn't have that. You don't look at somebody else and say, oh, God, bad idea. <laughs> not good. That's bad, right? That's a really, really bad idea. You can't say that. It's impossible for you to look in the mirror and go, bad idea, God. It's impossible for you to look at somebody else and say, bad idea, God, because God doesn't have bad ideas, and you're God's idea. Now, the greatest king that Israel ever had was a guy named David. You guys know David. 
A lot of times when we think about David, we think about the times that David messed up. Oh, David, way to go, adultery. Awesome, you know? Or, oh, way to go, um, you know, you murdered someone. Or, or whatever. You know, sometimes we tend to focus on the things that people have done that are negative or sinful. Isn't it awesome how God forgives us of our sin and actually gives us a second chance of life? How many guys have made a second chance, right, man? Yeah, me too. Uh, it's easy to be judgmental. It's easy to look at somebody else's life and go, oh, man, you're like so far gone or whatever. Bottom line is, we're all just products of God's awesome, marvelous mercy and grace. And that's just the bottom line. So David, long after a lot of things have happened in his life, decided that he was going to be blown away by something. He was blown away by the fact that he was God's idea. He was blown away by the fact that God decided to purposely make him and design him. And so he, under the inspiration of God, wrote Psalm 139. And I put these verses in your notes. The cool thing about these verses is this. We can identify with all the same verses. He wrote them 3,000 years ago, and they apply to us. Because we're God's idea, and God made us, and we're designed by Him too. So we can be blown away in God's incredible power. Look at what he says. Psalm 139, verse 14. He says, thank you. He leads off with those words. Thank you for my life. Thank you for the way you made me. Thank you, God. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. You have to say it like that. Marvelous. All right, here we go. Ready? Marvelous. Your work is marvelous, right? Then he says this. He says, your workmanship is marvelous. And he says, how well I know it. I know it for a fact that I'm marvelous. Now, a lot of times we don't like to think of ourselves as that way. But if you look in the mirror and you have a hard time with that, just kind of say the fact that you're marvelous and God doesn't make mistakes and He made a masterpiece when He made you. Because look at the next verse. It says, You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the darkness of the womb. That's amazing. The word woven is a Hebrew word that refers to the smallest little awesome detail of your smallest fiber of all that you are was purposely designed by the God of the universe. It was His idea to make you exactly the way you are, down to the smallest element of who you are. And you are a work of art. You're a tapestry. You're a, uh, that's what the connection is here with woven. You're a work of art, a beautiful tapestry, and all the details of your life were chosen by God. When you were in the womb, for goodness sake, that's crazy. In the darkness of the womb, God was making you. Verse number 16. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Which basically means this. Before you lived one second of your life, your entire life was mapped out by God. He already knew it. He already knew it. He already knew everything that you would do. Every decision you would make. He knew the date and time and second you would be born. The date, time, second you would die. He knows all of it. It's all in his brain. He knows it. It's all been written out and walled down. That's how, not how much, I don't even know how to say it. You're not an accident. That's what I'm trying to say. That's how much not of an accident you are. It makes it make sense. <laughs> but you know what? God made your way. And it's cool. You know, just show it. All right. So here's the thing. It's impossible for you to be an accident. Now, when you read those words, there's a couple of things that, that come into my mind that absolutely make me understand, bring me to the point where I can't even makes sense of certain things. Like for instance, it makes no sense to me that anybody would ever be critical or would complain about the way they look or about the life that they have. It makes no sense. When you read Psalm 139 and you understand that it was all God's idea, that you were all God's idea, and that He chose your shape, and He chose your size, and He chose your color, and He chose your purpose, and He chose your life, and He knew everything about your life before you lived one second of your life. It makes no sense that we would look back at God and say, Hey, God, please screw God. Man, you messed up my life. You messed up my looks. You blew it, God. God doesn't blow anything. God does everything perfect. He does everything marvelous. He does everything in an incredible way. That's just how God is. That's how God rolls. And the bottom line is this. Next time somebody looks at you, maybe they look down on you because of the way you look. 
You just look at them with all the kindness in your heart, a big smile on your face, and you just say this. You know what? Let me just stop you. God made me the way he made me so that I can be patient and ignorant people. <laughs> and just smile and just want to hug them. Just give them a, a mental hug. You know, when you do that. Now, how many believe there's a difference between ignorance and stupidity? Yeah, there is. They didn't call them stupid, just call them ignorant. A lot of people, they're not stupid, they're just ignorant. They're ignorant of the fact that you are marvelous and that you are a masterpiece. They don't get it. Because we see everything like, oh, everybody has to fit in the way we think normal is. Everybody has to look this way. Everybody has to act this way. And if you don't, you're some kind of freak. You're some kind of weirdo. And a lot of people get ostracized because of whatever, because of the way God made them. And that's absolute ignorance. It's always been, you know what the amazing thing about it? Is the moment that God made you, it was never about you. It was never about you. It was never about me. It was always about Him. It was always about filling His purpose, His plan, being obedient and submissive to whatever His will is for my life. Whether I agree with it or not, whether I think it's easy or not, whether I think it's fun or not, none of that stuff even matters. It is all about living for Him. Because He's the one that made us and chose everything about us. We're marvelous. We're, we're made in a way that we can bring glory to Him. The way you're shaped, the color you are, the size you are, the shape you are, is the exact color, size, and shape that's going to give God the most glory and the most praise. So, give yourself a high five in the mirror and go on. Romans chapter 9 and verse 20. Look what it says. Who, who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Show what is formed, say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out make out the same lump of clay, pottery that's for noble purposes and pottery that's for common use? Survey said, yes, very simple answer. He's God. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants, and whatever he does is right. It's just right. Because he's the creator. I always think about a guy by the name of Nick Vajusic, and I'm butchering the guy's name. But we showed a video of Nick back at Albee Elementary School, and Nick was born with no arms and no legs. He has no arms and no legs. And, you know, the thing about his story, you know, he's a real positive guy. He's always positive, positive, positive. He's always good things. He always treats people with kindness and and he's got no arms and legs from a, from a little child, from, from birth. And uh, the thing that just brought to me about Nick's story is that he said when he was a little kid, he would lay in bed at night crying and begging, God, please give me arms. Please give me legs. Isn't that amazing how there's so many things we have and we take it for Granted. It's ridiculous. We take it all for granted. This kid is begging God. You know what he said? He said, God, I know you can do it. And he said, when you do it, God, I'll give you the glory. I'll give you the praise. And you know what? The kid, his whole life, woke up every morning with no arms and no legs. And isn't it amazing how now Nick takes his condition and he travels all around the world. And this is what he does. He brings people to Jesus Christ. Because of his condition. And it's almost as if God just wants to take... I mean, how many of you as a parent would do anything for your kids? Here you have a precious little kid that's begging you for arms and legs. What do you think? God's thinking. God's thinking. I want to give you arms and legs so bad. He said, but Nick, i got to tell you, dude, I made you perfect. I made you marvelous. I made you as a work of art. I made you just the size, just the shape, just the color that you're supposed to be. That's going to give me a maximum amount of glory. And I know people look at you and say, you don't fit in. And you look different. 
and people make fun of you. And man, I know this stuff as a kid, but I want you to trust in me. And I want you to see that I'm going to use you in amazing ways to bring me glory. And listen, that's what it's all about. Whether you have arms and legs or not, no matter where you are in this, in this life, when it comes to how you look or what you think your purpose is or, or whatever, it's all about Him. John chapter 9 and verse 3, there's this family that gives birth to a little baby boy. And you always, refer, I always refer to kids as pumpkins, man. They're just little pumpkins. And, and that's because that's what they are. And this little baby was born and he couldn't see. He was blind from birth. And so his parents were doing everything they could to help raise him. And, and they look around at other families and their kids can see. Oh, their kids run and play. Their kids can do all these other things. And this family has to take great care of everything that they do in their little boy's life because he needs help. He can't see. He's blind. So in Bible days, if you had a disability, you were going to grow up and be a beggar. You had no choice. That's all you... In order to get your sustenance, you were going to have to beg for it. And so this guy, as he got older, became a beggar. And then all of a sudden, after this long life of darkness, Jesus walks by. He's got all his apostles with him, right? So they look at the guy and they throw out this question. Hey, oh my, who sinned, man? Was it, was it this guy that sinned or was it his parents that sinned so that he would be born blind? And they, they go right to the question of why. And, and that's a normal question. You know, don't let anybody pile on you because you ask the question, why? God made you inquisitive. And I think you ought to ask why. <laughs> but they asked why. And Jesus used it as an opportunity to teach his disciples. And he basically said this. You know what? It wasn't his sin. It wasn't his parents' sin. He said, this guy has been blind his whole life. So that this moment, this time, this day, when I walk by him, and I touch his eyes, and I heal him, God is going to be glorified. So if you're blind, and you're hearing Jesus say this, at what point do you go, really? Okay, so I've been through this struggle in my life. All my life I've been blind. So this day, God can get glory? Wow. But it's true. How many times did Paul beg God, Please, God, take away this thorn in the flesh. Some people think it was his eyes. And like in Galatians, I think it was Galatians when he said, you would have even given your eyes for me. Because his eyes were a, were a problem to him. And, you know, he begged God three times. And every single time God said, no, no, and no, I'm not taking it away. The reason I'm not taking it away is because you are marvelous. You are a masterpiece. And you're made in just the right way to give me the maximum amount of glory. Because that's the purpose of your life. That's what it all boils down to. Second thing that doesn't make sense to me is that we would be created by God and it have nothing to do with Him. Does that make any sense? I mean, really, when you think about it, does it make any sense at all that God would make us? He would make us in His image and then we would choose... To deny him? To not even believe that he exists? It's crazy. Colossians 1.16 says, All things were made by him and for him. Period. Done. In his name. What's the purpose of life? Just read that verse. That's it. Right there. He made everything. He made everything for himself. He's allowed to do it. He's God. I wouldn't be here if God didn't choose to make me. He designed me to fulfill his purpose. My main responsibility is to bring him glory and praise with the life that he gives me. I'm literally just a pile of dust. When I die, I'm going back to dust. That's it. God, thanks for working with dust. Thanks for breathing life into a pile of dust. Thanks for giving me a pile of dust everything that you've given me. Everything that I have is from him. He is the one that's awesome. He is the one that loves us. He is the one that is the ultimate answer to connecting the dots in my life when things don't make sense. And I will tell you this, you will never connect the dots in your life unless God is in the center. Never. It will never make sense. There will never be the hope. There will never be the fulfillment. 
Because everything else comes up empty compared to what God can give you in your life. When He is at the center of your life. Which, by the way, He's your creator, so duh, right? He ought to be at the center of our lives. And even though He's done all this for us, people choose to rebel against Him and disobey Him and dishonor Him and to treat Him like an afterthought and to only talk to Him when we need something and then, you know, even to choose not to believe in Him. To me, I just think that's weird. It's just a weird thing. People think Christians are weird, but you know what? I think it's weird to believe in God. It's a weird thing. I believe this. Everybody that, that, that chooses not to believe in God deep, deep in their hearts, they truly, they know about Him anyway. And they believe in Him anyway, deep in their hearts. I believe they believe in Him. That He exists and that He's real. And one of the reasons why we know that is because, and I've said it a thousand times in this church, but in a moment of crisis, what's the first thing we say? We say, oh my God. And I wonder if anybody ever says, okay, where'd that come from? I don't know why I keep calling on God. I don't believe him. But uh, I don't know what happened, but it's like built into my fiber. I made his image. Because I made in his image, I reach out to him. I told you about the time, several times, that like we went hiking and we went to the top of the Waterfall. We got to the top of this cliff and we're looking at this waterfall, me and the boys, and it's so cool. And then I went away from Michael for some dumb reason, and I'm looking at something else, and I get a splash. He fell into the water at the top of the waterfall. And John, who happened to be right there, grabbed him by the shirt and pulled him out. And I went, Oh my God! I screamed at the top of my lungs. John pulled him out, looked at me, and said, Dad, don't think God's name bang. <laughs> I said, I'm not taking his name in vain. I'm freaking out. <laughs> I'm freaking out. I thought my kid was going over a waterfall. I didn't know. How do you, what, what do you do when your kid goes over a waterfall and you're in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> you scream, oh my God. That's what you do. So here's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you really fast four words that you can kind of get into your brain that you can kind of talk to somebody, at least put the idea in their minds that yes, there is a God, yes, He is real, and I want you to give it this some real thought. Here's the, here are the four words. Number one is knowledge. And write these down, by the way. I don't, you don't have to, I guess. It's not going to be tested on it, but it just be nice to know it. Uh, knowledge, cause, design, and morality. Knowledge, cause, design, and morality. Now, when it comes to knowledge, that's basically this. Look, we're all talking about God. Somewhere along the line, somebody told us about God. Who told them about God? Where did the whole concept about God come from? Why do I know that there's this supreme being that, that, that holds everything together and, and is the uh, originator of all things? Where does that come from? Why do I sit here and say, no, life is not random because there is a supreme being? Where does that knowledge come from? Just the fact that we have the knowledge of God suggests the fact that there's a God. And I think if you talk to somebody about that and put that into their brain, I think they're going to think about it. Oh, you don't believe in God? Yeah, but you still know about it, don't you? Even though he didn't admit You know about it. Yeah, I do. I guess I do know about it. The second word is cause. You look at the universe and how everything spins in such incredible precision and order, and you ask yourself the question, okay, so what made all this? You only have to have half a brain, really, to step back and say, where did all this come from? Right? When you want to know where that came from? When you want to know where everything that we see, this universe and everything came from? There has to be a cause. Something, something had to be in a state where they didn't have to have a beginning. Where they were from everlasting to everlasting. Where they were eternal. And they not only created everything, but then they put everything into motion. It just makes sense. Had to have a cause. The next word is design. Look, if the simplest things in the world have to be designed, what about the most complex things in the universe? You walk down the street and all of a sudden you see a painting laying in the street. How many of you think about that painting and go, hey, I wonder where this random act of art came from? I wonder how all those colors got together and formed on that canvas. I wonder how that canvas just came together randomly like that. Do you ask that? No one asks that. If you did, you'd be nuts. You'd be crazy. I saw a random act of art. The paintings just started swirling in the air. Some paintings look like paintings just swirling in the air. Not this one. This is a beautiful one. Or whatever. Nobody says that. 
But yet, for whatever reason, we look at the universe and we say it all just happened. We, we can't even can't you say that about any the simplest things in the world have to have a designer, and yet the most complex things in the universe just happened randomly? It's absolutely crazy. I remember one time Christine asked me to put a foosball table together. It took me all night. It was till 4 o'clock in the morning trying to put this ridiculous foosball table together. I was getting ready to just crush it with a hammer. And I'm thinking to myself, it takes this much effort, this much design, this much following the directions, and it's a foosball table. What about the universe? What about the human body? I mean, how can we say all of that just happened randomly? We're crazy if we say that happened randomly. Think about the, and I know, I, I stick at science and, and whatever, but I know we have an Earth and I know we have a moon. And I know the moon revolves or orbits around the Earth every 27.3 days with absolute incredible precision. And I know that that moon and that Earth are, are also orbiting around the sun. And it happens every 365.256363 days. Okay. So we have it that precise? So it happens at that rate, at that distance, at that speed, every single year, year after year after year? And nobody's keeping it going and it's not slowing down and everything's moving? Why is the Earth such a perfect distance away? I mean... Any, any closer would be crispy, any father would be frozen, right? But the earth is in a perfect place to where it sustains life. I'm going to tell you, to sit back and think all of that happened randomly is crazy. And I'll tell you this, God said it even more forcefully. So don't shoot the messenger. Psalm 14 and verse number 1. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. God said. God says it because it's foolish for a person who's made by God in the image of God for the purposes of God to look at God and say, you don't exist. And then stick the tongue at him. Foolish. Crazy. Then there's morality. Who came up with the big list of do's and don'ts? And why is the same list the same in all our brains? Why do we know intuitively this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad? Trust me, the reason there's good is because there's God. And the only reason there's, that bad even exists is because one day there's going to come a reckoning. One day there's going to be a day of accountability. There would be no bad without accountability. Trust me, there's a God. We're going to stand before him one day. It's a reality because there's morality. Romans 2.15 it says they demonstrate that God's law is written within them. The fact that you have a conscience points to the fact that there is a God, that He is real, that He exists. Why do I feel guilty and fearful about some things I do, and I feel great and confident about other things I do? Because there's right and there's wrong. That's why. And who made that list? Alright, so let's close with this. you got good news and bad news. What would you like first? Bad news or good news? Big bad news. That is good. Thank you. By the way, that's what I always pick first. I don't know if I'm negative or if I just want to get that thing out of the way and get my thing again. I hope the good news outweighs the bad news, right? Here's the bad news. Very simple. And I hate to bring you in here and give you a donut and sit down and tell you this, but here it is. You're cursed. I know that's things. But you're cursed. The reason you're cursed is because the Bible says that there is no possible way that you can keep all the law in and of yourself. If you can't keep the law, all of it, in and of yourself, the Bible says you're cursed. Not only are you cursed, but you're separated. The Bible says in Isaiah that your sins come between you and God. The Bible also says you're a sinner because you were born that way. Remember the great theologian, Lady Gaga? What does she say? Maybe you were born this way, right? She's right. You were born this way. You're born as a sinner. Now, that's the bad news. Here's the good news. Anybody know another name for the good news? The gospel. It's all about the gospel. The good news, which is the gospel, is this. Jesus Christ came to this earth, and he dealt with your curse. He took your curse. The reason he did was because the Bible says that cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, so we know that he dealt with your curse. We also know that he dealt with the fact that you 
were separated from God because when he was on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why the separation? Why have you turned your back on me? He dealt with your separation. He also dealt with your sin. Because the Bible says that he took your sin and my sin in his own body on the tree so that we might be made righteous. He did that for us. That's good news. The good news is you have a past that's forgiven. You have a power for living. You have a home in heaven. And the amazing news about it is that it wasn't based on you. It was all based on him. See, here's the deal. We have this way of thinking in our brains when it comes to everything you get in life you got to earn. And so what we do is, is we take that human way of thinking and we apply it to the gospel. We apply it to the gift that God gives about salvation. And we think, look, dude, you've got to earn it. Go to the average person and say this. If you die, where are you going to go? They're going to say this. Well, I hope heaven. I'm doing all I can. God, I'll be the best person I can. get in heaven. You know, right? That's what people say. Maybe not like that, but they say it, right? They say, yeah, I'm trying to get there. I hope I make it. That's what they say. Well, what are they thinking? Well, they're thinking like every other human thinks. They're thinking like, hey, he's given me this salvation, but i got to earn it. i got to make sure that I do this and do that. And what Jesus is saying is this. He rolls out a thing called grace, and it blows our minds because he says you don't have to earn it. You could never earn it. You could never ever be good enough to get into heaven. It's not what you do. It's what I did on the cross when I shared my blood for you. That's the gospel. The gospel is grace. And the moment you have to do anything to receive salvation, it's not grace anymore. It's no longer grace. At that point, it becomes a debt. At that point, it becomes you walking into heaven going, Well, what do you think, huh? I think I did pretty dang good. <laughs> right? I mean, really. You'd be like, Give me my keys to my mansion. My bed. Go, man. <laughs> you know, let me tell you what you're going to do when you stand before God. You're not going to stand. You're going to fall on your face. Because He's holy. There's nothing that we can ever do for one second to brag about any part of our life at all. It is by the grace of by the grace of God that you're breathing right now. Wow, how can you be an afterthought? The good news is it's all Jesus and not us. James 2.10 If a person who keeps all the laws except one, that person is, is just as guilty as the person who breaks all the laws. In other words, you don't have a chance. There's no way it's going to happen. That's why Christ is essential. What happens is when you put your faith in Christ, you're placed into Christ. In our church at PBC, we call that Freaky Friday theology. Remember that movie? Mom's in the daughter, daughter's in the mom. You accept Jesus Christ, you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you get all the benefits of Christ. Are you able to keep all the law? Survey said. Is Jesus able to keep all the law? Survey said. Yes. So if you're in Jesus, guess what? You're able to keep all the law. It was always through Him. It was always through his ability. It was never based on you. Never based on me. It's grace. It's a grace because I'm in Jesus. It's the gospel. Last question. We're out. What happens if I come to Park Valley and at the end of the service I pray, Dear Heavenly Father, be my Lord and Savior. And then as soon as I pray that prayer, I go out and I get in my car. And I'm driving down the road and somebody tries to cut me off. So I speed up next to them and I tell them they're number one. And I, I put my brakes on and I start slowing down. I'm like, hey, you're slow, hey, you're slow, so slow. And you start freaking out like a road rip. And all of a sudden, you stop and you think, oh, my word, 20 minutes ago, I just said Jesus in my heart. I'll be a jerk. Be an idiot. I'm treating people like garbage. I think the question you're probably going to ask yourself is, okay, 20 minutes ago, I was going to heaven. Not because I told them they're number one, I think they're going to hell. Wouldn't you think that may be? So here's the deal. Romans 10, 13 says, if you accept Christ as your Savior, you're saved. The word saved means saved, delivered, protected, preserved, and made whole. 
Those words sound kind of final, don't they? Hey, you're made whole. Hey, you're protected. You're preserved. You're safe. Those words sound permanent. That's exactly what you are. John 1, 12. But to all who believed in him, accepted him, he gave the right to become children. That means God says, you're my kid. I love talking about eternal security from the standpoint of me being a dad and me having five kids. Or five kids. Oh, <laughs> I got four kids. We have four, right? <laughs> and I have four kids. Four boys. And I always think from the standpoint of, you know what? They're my kids. And they break my heart that they're my kids. They may end up in jail one day, but they're my kids. They may, they may totally disrespect me in my face, but they're my kids. And they will always be my kids. And I'm going to always love them from head to toe because they're my kids. It's just the way it is. They're my kids because they were born into my family. They're Christine and mine kids because they were born to us. I'm going to tell you, the day you accepted Christ as your Savior, you got a new father. He's your heavenly father. He's God. Because you were born into his family. And there's nothing weird or creepy about being born again. Sometimes people will say, oh, you're a born again person. Born again, born again, born again. Like it's weird. It's like not weird at all. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. How many people walk into a maternity ward to go see a person that just had a little baby? You walk in and you go, oh, that's weird. <laughs> I gotta go, I'm sorry, it's just too weird. Weird me out. Weird me out. Who would say that? It's weird. That's weird in itself. You have a baby, you send out birth announcements, and everybody celebrates. Why do you think the Bible says that heaven rejoices over one person that gives their life to Christ? There's a party going on. You know why? Because there's a new little baby pumpkin. <laughs> a new little baby pumpkin that's been born. That now has a new father. And everybody in heaven's having a party over it. It's awesome. So you're born into his family. And God doesn't say sight. And God doesn't say not. And God doesn't give you eternal life and then take it away from you. Why? Because you'll always be his kid if you're in his family. If you've received his son. You're saved. You're saved. You're protected. You're preserved. You're made whole. You're family. You're always going to be his family. But it's normal for us to think that way. Last three verses. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. It's by God's grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not a result of your own efforts. It's God's gift so that nobody can boast about it. Titus 3, 5. He saved us not because of the good things that we've done, but because of his mercy. He's washed away our sins. He's given us a new life through the Holy Spirit. He's generously poured out the Spirit upon us because of what Jesus Christ, our Savior, did. Not what we do. He declared us not guilty because of His great kindness. And now we know that we will inherit eternal life. We know it. It's for sure. It's in stone. And salvation is a gift. Who comes up to you and says, Happy birthday! And gives you a gift and says, That'll be $29.99. <laughs> you don't pay for your gifts. That's just weird. You don't pay for salvation. Jesus paid for salvation with His blood. We're off the hook. He took it all for us. Last verse. Romans 11.29 says this, For God's gifts and His call can never be withdrawn. Never. When you accept Christ, the Bible says that old things are passed away, the old, all things are become new. The person that steps up to the plate and says this, you know what? Oh, okay, great deal, man. So I say a prayer, and I can do whatever I want. I like my faith, give me that religion. People don't understand. People don't understand that when you give your heart and life to Christ, old things are passed away, Behold, all things have become new. He is now my Father. And all the things that I think I want to do, all the things that I think give me fulfillment, whether it's lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, they give me nothing. I don't get to sin. I get to serve. I get to be His child. I get to do what pleases Him. I get to be His disciple. I get to follow Him. It's all about Him. That's what happens. 
God changes our stinking thinking. I've never said that in any other service. <laughs> he changes our stinking thinking to the right kind of thinking. He changes our mind. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a minute? If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, then today's the day. I want to give you a chance to pray a simple prayer and ask Christ into your life. Why don't you pray this? Dear Heavenly Father, I am so lost with God. I want so bad to be in your family. I want to be your kid. I want you to be my father. So I want you to know that right now, by faith, I accept your son, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. And I pray that you would forgive me of my sin. And I pray that you would give me a second chance. Thank you. Thank you for saving me, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you, Lord, for our purpose. God, help us to open our eyes and stop thinking about ourselves. Help us to realize that it's always been about you. You never created us for us. You created us for you. May we take every step of our journey in this life that you've given us, thinking about how we give you praise and how we give you glory, and you take care of the rest. You always do. Thank you. Thank you, God, for the fact that you're a reality. Give us, equip us, Lord, with boldness and courage to be able to enter into the lives of other people and give them something to think about when it comes to you. And I pray also, Lord, that you would help us to always be thankful for the gospel, that it's not about us, it's about you and what you did for us on the cross. Thank you for the change that takes place in our mind when we accept Christ. Thank you for everyone that's here. Build a hedge of protection around every family, every child, every husband, every wife, every single person, every college student, every person that's here in this audience. God, wrap your arms around them and bless them. And may they see in a specific way your direction. And may they understand that no life's not easy, but boy is it ever fulfilling when you're the center. In Jesus' name. Amen.